happened here. All right. Ready, ready to roll. Hello, okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this live stream. We're finally up and running. Um, this is the first live stream I've had on this channel, so um, I will ask you to bear with me while we get all of the little teething problems uh, niggled out. This is an Ask Me Anything about machine learning. So it's been promised for quite a while, and here it is. Um, so any and every question that you have about machine learning, we're going to try and answer it in this session here today. My name's Mike Chambers. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Mike Chambers, and I'm an AWS machine learning hero, which gives me the kind of opportunity to do this kind of live stream for you today. But as you can probably hear in the background, because there's a little bit of audio there, I'm not alone, and I have got some helpers with me. Now, I'm going to say to both my uh, helpers, Luis and Zafdar, if you can turn the volume down on the YouTube stream, otherwise everybody's going to get super confused. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so let's introduce the uh, guests that I have with me today. First of all, Zafdar, hello. How are you? Hi, um, I'm good. Thank you, um, uh, Mike. It is nice uh, joining this uh, communication, and we will have uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, things to learn and you know to answer questions. Absolutely. So, Zafra, tell us about yourself. You're um, you're from Chicago, for Chicago, Illinois. You work for AWS as a technical account manager. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I'm working in AWS as a technical account manager. And basically, uh, you know, like all of us, machine learning is my passion too. And, uh, you know, I would, I am honored to be part of this community and hopefully we will exchange some ideas and, you know, it will be beneficial for all of us. Awesome. Now I'm going to come back to you in just a second. I want to know what excites you about machine learning. But before I ask you that, um, we have Luis as well. So um, Luis, hi, how are you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. And I need you to tell us where you are because you have some background noise we need to talk about. I know, that's right. So uh, my, uh, welcome, everybody. Yeah, my name is Luis Salcido. I'm a technical account manager as well with AWS. And uh, similar to the community here, uh, my passion is uh, machine learning. I uh, used to work for Amazon Go, um, the, uh, the store that employs a lot of the techniques that uh, later, you know, became available in AWS. And ever since, um, uh, that cultivated me, and you know, and uh, I'm here to share some of those experiences and hopefully learn also from you. I'm in Mexico City today. We're actually deploying a project here, and uh, we have some very interesting. Uh, Noises. You can hear the airplanes. You can hear the uh, the guys selling camotes. And so anyway, we're, we'll, we'll we'll make sure that you guys have a great experience. But very glad to have to be here. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So um, just before we came live, there was some very interesting whistling sounds coming out. You were saying it's something to do with the steam being let off through whistles outside your office. So that's if sad. you hear that, that's what that is. Very <laughs> Very exciting. Okay, Safta, um, you've talked to us about that. You, you obviously, you are passionate about machine learning in the role that you do, and I think in your everyday life as well. What excites you the most about machine learning? Yeah, um, actually, when um, when I uh, basically started, uh, you know, looking at the machine learning, um, I, I, the, the, the most amazing thing which I noticed was the the hidden patterns, you know, which humans cannot see. And what they have been discovered by the machine learning. You know, we are having new songs composed from the old songs, right? New, a uh, new type. Even I was reading an article that uh, new blood types can be can be can be found based on different computation and different uh, pattern matching. We may have new uh, things which we which existed around us, but we never knew about them, right? So, like you know, in medical field. Um, in research, in marketing, in sales, you know, uh, the, com the, the company's business models now, they are completely dependent on machine learning and, and also our lives, you know. So, so, so it's everywhere. The thing which excites me most that machine learning is everywhere. Absolutely. No, that, that's really awesome. And 
and so ubiquitous, right? So machine learning is now absolutely something which is at the center of businesses and social enterprises. It's not just something which is relegated to, um, you know, universities and theory, right? So we're really democratizing access to machine learning. What about yourself, Luis? Um, what excites you the most about machine learning? You, you touch on the magic word, you know, uh, not only is available everywhere, now it's so simple. So I will say now machine learning has been commoditized to, you know, we're going to talk about SageMaker, which is one engine that uh, amazes me how easy you take off the shelf an algorithm and can be doing, solving very, very, very difficult problems that before you could have invested years of research, a lot of data, a lot of experimentation. Now you're, those tools are at your fingertips, just as simple as calling a function. And, uh, and that is opening the doors for so much innovation and so much great, great uh, other things. So for me, you know, what excites me the most is, is, is that, that, that uh, commutation of the, the, the complexities in, in, uh, of machine learning. Yeah, no, awesome. The, the, yeah, I guess maybe the operationalizing of machine learning. It's now, it's as you said, it's 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 accessible to everybody, but there is still a learning curve, right? You still got to understand how it works in order to be able to make the best use out of it. And I guess that's partially what today um, is about. So um, I'm a machine learning trainer. That's kind of what I do on my day to day. So I enjoy helping people sort of go on that journey of learning about machine learning. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. So um, obviously, the three of us here are here to answer every and all questions that you have. Hopefully, I'm sure there are going to be some curveballs that you can throw at us and we can see what we can do with those. Um, but there is obviously this chat box in the YouTube live stream. So please go into the chat box and start to uh, write your comments in there. Comments about you know what you want to see, what you want to hear us talk about, questions that you have, anything like that. Look, we have a completely multinational team here today. So I'm actually calling in from uh, Brisbane, Australia. So right in the middle of the East Coast there, um, where it's actually quite early in the morning. Um, well, not that early in the morning, but it's it's in the morning. Um, uh, Safdar, you're in um, Chicago. I think we mentioned, Luis, you're in um, Mexico. So look, everybody else, I want you to just get into the chat window now and just start letting us know where you're from. Let's get the session going in the chat window. Um, and whilst you're doing that, I'll run over a little bit of an agenda and a few bits and pieces that we're doing today. So essentially, we're going to kick it off with a little bit of a presentation. I'm going to go through a few slides where I introduce you to um, a machine learning uh, a project, if you like, but one that we can do in our heads. So this is going to be super easy. Sit back, relax, grab your cup of tea. I have, of course, have got my cup of tea. I'm a little bit nervous. I've got so much equipment in front of me. I don't want to spill it. But anyway, um, sit back, relax. We'll go through this um, example of machine learning, which is completely visual. Um, it's not going to be super, super high level. It's not going to be like that. We're going to get into a little bit of detail, and we're going to talk about some key um, terminology and things to think about when you're actually putting together a machine learning project. So we're going to do that. Um, hopefully, that might even answer some of the questions that we have. And then from there, we'll branch out into um, let's answer your questions on that presentation and on other things uh, that you've got as well. We've also got some questions that people have submitted throughout the week in the lead up to this as well. So we'll probably have a look at those as well. And We've got two prizes to give away. I'm not doing this very well, am I? I probably should have teased this throughout the whole week that we've got prizes to give away. Um, but we have got prizes to give away. We've got two. We're going to give away um, $100 of AWS credits to the best question, the best newbie question. So everybody's a newbie in something to do with machine learning. It's an enormous topic, right? So don't think that you have to know everything about everything. Um, none of us actually do. So the best newbie question, we've got $100 AWS credits for that one. And also the, um, the person who's helping out the most in the community. So if you're in this chat and you know the answers to some of these questions and you can help out too, I want to thank you for doing that. So there's $100 of AWS credits for you as well. And we'll figure out how on earth we're going to connect and um, get you guys to get those credits. Maybe if you just link with me on LinkedIn, DM me on there if we say that you've won, and we'll, we'll figure out how to do that later. OK, so um, where have we got people calling in from? I've, I've asked people to shout out where they're calling in from. 
Um, Luis, Safdar, if you're keeping an eye on the chat, where, where are we? Uh, oh my where goodness, are the audience you have at? people from all over uh, San Jose, Nigeria. Man, it's, uh, it's amazing. I, I never, you know, thought that, you know, that you had such a broad audience. So um, welcome everybody, I guess. That's awesome. Nigeria, that's awesome. What time is it in Nigeria? Let us know there. It must be, um, is it fairly late, I would imagine, in Nigeria, if I'm getting my time zones correct? It's always difficult when you're trying to choose a time of day to do these things where you can get um, the biggest impact. So Saturday morning here in Australia, I'm calling most of you from the future. And let me tell you, the future is looking good. All right. So um, let's get into this then. Let me jump into this presentation. I'm going to show you um, an example of a machine learning project. Um, I'm going to put these slides up on the screen now. If I can press that button, makes it all work. Um, and so here we are. So in order to be able to do any machine learning project, it's really important up front to actually make sure that you've got the question that you're trying to answer. So, so what is it that I'm trying to answer? You really do need to define that up front. You can't just throw machine learning at data and hope that magic happens, unfortunately. I wish you could. Um, and this slide here represents the problem space that we're going to be using for this little talk here, for this little example. Um, and it's an animal rescue center. And in an animal rescue center, we have a whole uh, a bunch of animals in here. Obviously, they're all dogs. Um, and each of those dogs eats food. That's not a surprise to any of us, of course. Um, but as, a, as someone who runs this animal rescue center in this fictitious world, I'm gonna make sure that we've got enough food for all of the dogs that we have and potentially for the dogs that are going to arrive as well in the future. We need to make sure, and we need to make sure we're not over provisioning food because money's tight, right? And this is probably a charity we're talking about here. And what we notice is um, probably something fairly obvious, but as domain experts in this data, we notice this, that the larger the dog, the more food they tend to eat, okay? Obvious stuff maybe, but. That's what we've noticed. And we, we, we wonder if we can use that data in a machine learning scenario to be able to figure out how much food a dog will eat when it arrives through the front door. So a brand new dog comes in, it's looking a little bit worse for wear, we need to look after it, we need some food, how much food is it gonna need? So we go ahead and we decide to do this in a sort of machine learning statistical analysis kind of way. So what we do is we measure the heights of all of the dogs that we have, and we measure the amount of food that each of those dogs eats. And, and you can see here, I've got a graph ready to plot my data. And on the X axis on the bottom there, we've got height. On the Y axis up the side, we've got food. And so we take um, a, a statistical value of, of one of the dogs that we found. We found this dog here that I've just plotted on the graph. They're not very high, and they don't eat very much food. Um, the next dog, well, it's a bit higher, actually eats quite a bit more food. And we plot all of the dogs that we have, all of those measurements that we've made, we plot them all on the graph like that. And so this is, this is not telling us anything that we didn't expect as humans with this simple problem, um, that the bigger the dog, the more food it eats. And we can see there, we can see that there is basically a linear relationship um, of this data. So it's essentially this linear, this linear line here kind of represents the relationship between the height of a dog and the amount of food it eats. And so we can use this, right? So when a new dog turns up, this little dog, um, little bow in its hair, looking a little bit forlorn, it needs our help um, and it's hungry, right? So we can measure the height of the dog. We do it pretty quickly without disturbing it. And then we can take that height, we can put it onto this graph that we've put together and we can map up that height to the amount of food that it probably will need, go and grab that food and we give that food to the dog. And the dog's super happy now because it's been rescued and um, it's happy that it's eating that food. Okay, so let's dive into this uh, a little bit more from a data point of view. Now we've sort of seen the scenario, we've seen how that works. And let's talk about it in terms of machine learning. And we're gonna introduce some terminology here as we go through and some concepts as well. So this is where we landed, right? We had all of our data points here and we had this nice big straight line through our data points that we could see represents fairly nicely the relationship between the height of a dog and the amount of food that that dog eats. But what about this line? Why did we choose that straight line? Why didn't we choose this line? This line here, this line goes through every single one of the data points in our data set. So surely this line is a better representation of the data that we have. Well, is it? 
Well, how are we going to find that out? And I'm going to have to confess here, I haven't quite told you the truth. These aren't all of the data points that we took when we measured the dogs that we had in our rescue center. There were a couple more that I kept back in order to be able to do some testing. And these are those data points. So you can now see these crosses. These are some extra data points. And we can use these data points to be able to help us to figure out which one of these lines, the super wiggly line that goes through every single one of the data points, or the straight line that doesn't actually go through any of the data points, but sort of goes through the middle of the group, if you like. We can use these new data points to figure out which one of these is the best. OK, so let's go ahead and do that. First of all, let's isolate out our wiggly line. Remember, this wiggly line went through every single one of the original data points that we looked at. So we've got this now, and we're going to use these extra data points we have. And we're going to measure the distance between these new data points and the wiggly line. So let's go ahead and do that. And so we measure the distance here, we measure the distance here, just in the one axis, on that food axis. So we can now see the difference um, between our new data points and the wiggly line that we were thinking could use to estimate what was necessary for our dogs. So let's take all of those differences and we'll add them all together. And let's store them off on the side here so that we've got them saved. So these are all of the differences for those data points for the wiggly line. Now let's swap it out and go to our straight line. Here's our straight line, and we've got the data points, exactly the same data points there. Let's now measure those differences so we can see that we've done that. And now let's shift that across to the side as well. So we've added up all of those differences from those, uh, those extra data points to that straight line. And we can see here the difference. So the difference between the test points that we had and the wiggly line, the test points that we had and the straight line. And so is it the wiggly line or is it the straight line, which is actually a better representation of our data? And probably you know this already, it's the straight line, right? Because we have a, a, the smaller amount of difference between those extra points that I threw up and that straight line. So that's an example of how machine learning can actually decide what line works the best. Now, let's start to throw in some terminology so we can see this in relation to uh, a machine learning project. When, we, when I put all these things up on the screen, I try to talk about them in general terms. Now let's talk about them in terms of machine learning terms. So these green dots here, so the dots on our screen, the original data points that we spoke about, this is training data. So this data we used uh, and in this particular exercise, as humans, we did this in our brains, we used this to be able to draw that straight line. These green dots influenced where that straight line was going to be drawn. So this is our training data. These other dots, now these da data points here, they are created, they have been measured in exactly the same way, right? So we did it in the same process to be able to gather data. We just kept them back. Um, and this is our testing data. So it's exactly the same kind of data, but literally we just kept it back and we didn't allow them to influence where that straight line was going to be drawn. And so this straight line that I keep talking about, this is actually our model. And in machine learning terms, this is our machine learning model. We can use this, as we saw right back at the beginning, we can use this to make predictions about new pieces of data, or in this case, a new dog that arrived. We were able to use it to say, how much food does it want to eat? So this is our machine learning model. OK, so this was also a model, this super wiggly line, the one that went through all of our data points in the first, um, in the first instance. Um, but here's a piece of key terminology. This model is what we say is overfit. And that's to say that it goes through all of our training data. It matches all of our training data, but it did a really bad job at helping to approximate or make inference about new data. So it didn't do a very good job of matching any of the testing data at all. So it's overfit. And that's a significant problem in machine learning. This model, on the other hand, it doesn't match anything at all. So it doesn't match any of our training data. It doesn't match any of our testing data. And it's an awful, awful machine learning model. And we'll say, basically, it's underfit. So it doesn't go anywhere near what we need. 
This model, however, the one that we have talked about already, the one we like and one we've shown actually does the best job at representing our data set. We say that this model generalizes well. That's key terminology. And so those are key points that I wanted to raise about the um, machine learning space that we're working in. What I've done here, what I've hoped you can see from this, it's a fairly simple machine learning project problem. We can basically do it in our heads. So maybe it's not really machine learning, but it uses all of the same principles. You saw how that we can create our model from the data points that we had. We can do that just by drawing a line. You saw how we can analyze which model is going to work the best. And in this case, we just did that on two models, a super wiggly one or a straight one. And we've seen how we used training data and how it's different from testing data. Whilst the data is collected in the initial exercise in exactly the same way, keeping that testing data back was really important in order for us to be able to get our machine learning model to come out the other side. Now, I know what you're thinking, or you may be thinking this. I know what I'm thinking. This is super, super simple. Um, what's the point of getting a machine to do this? And you're right, there's no point in getting a machine to do this. We've done it in our heads and we could do it in our heads. But where machine learning comes into play is when the data starts to get more complex than this. So we add more dimensions to our data. Now, I am uh, limited by the physical reality of the world that I live in, and I can only really describe data in three dimensions. And so I'll add another dimension onto the graph here just for now. So we've got the height of dogs down the bottom still, we've got the food that they eat, and we're gonna add another dimension. This is gonna be the number of wags per minute. So the tail on the dog, the number of times it wags per minute, our, our domain experts, the people who have been monitoring the dogs have written all of this down. And maybe we could assume that the faster the tail is wagging, the happier the dog is, maybe the more food it eats, I don't know but maybe. Um, so then we can plot our new data points in three-dimensional space. It's essentially a data cloud, a data point cloud um, with all of that data summarized in there. Now we can use exactly the same techniques that we just used to find our straight line, which is essentially a single dimension, single line. We can do it here to um, create a model for this data too. And that would look something like this. So a two-dimensional plane, essentially, a plane that goes through our three-dimensional data points. And we can use this in exactly the same way. We find out the height of the dog as it arrives. We measure the number of times it wags its tail per minute as it arrives. And then we can use this graph then to plot how much food that it would want to eat in this theoretical example of craziness. Now, that's an example of three dimensions. And you can see it's starting to get a little bit more complicated. But with machine learning, with real machine learning, we go beyond that, beyond three dimensions, beyond five dimensions, 10 dimensions. We can have hundreds or thousands of dimensions to our data set. And, and I think Zafdar mentioned this before as well. It, it, machine learning is about getting visibility into your data. It's about getting this analysis and looking for patterns inside of your data that humans can't see. That's the real trick to machine learning. And if I could throw up a graph with 1,000 dimensions in there, it would break everything. We couldn't possibly contemplate it. But the processes that we've just gone through, they can be done in exactly the same way by the machine learning algorithm, because it can work in that high dimension space to be able to produce a model that will help us to be able to make predictions about things and about data that we have in the future after the model has been trained. And so that's what I wanted to show you today. I wanted to show you that example of a machine learning project, something we could do in our head, some of that key terminology, and then where that sort of get, gets amplified out to the big scale to where machine learning really comes into play. And I'm happy to tell you that in all cases here, all of those dogs got rehomed from our animal rescue center. So happy days, and we're open again to accept more dogs in the future, maybe. So that's my presentation for this first part of uh, this, uh, this live stream. Hopefully you found that useful. Let's go back to um, Luis and, uh, and Zafdar. Uh, how, how, how did, did, I don't know if you had a chance to, to watch much of that presentation or whether you've been just um, away in the chat. I haven't managed to look at much in the chat. So what's going on and what kind of questions do we have at the moment? Yeah, um, we have uh, 
couple of questions. Um, I think uh, one of the question uh, basically from Oscar is, uh, how do you determine that what would be best as testing data versus the training data? Ah, yes. Okay. Testing data versus training data. Um, so essentially it's it's the same data right so it needs to be the same data that's really important if you think back to the um example that we were using before um let me see if i can just grab that uh, slide back again um because i think it's kind of useful to have a look at um here we go um so you can see with this the the, the training data and the testing data was the same data as in it was collected at the same time in the process for our example here. Um, and whatever project you're doing, you go away with machine learning, you often need to gather as much data as you possibly can. And that's the more data you can gather, the better. And there's probably gonna be questions about how you can improve model performance and all that kind of stuff and model accuracy. The, the easy answer to that is get more data. So have lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And then literally all you need to do is slice off a portion of that. And depending on how much data you got and what kind of problem you're working on, something like an 80% 80 of your data for training, 20% maybe for testing is probably suitable. Um, there are caveats in that though, right? You need to make sure that your testing data is a good representation of your overall data. And so you do things like you'd randomize the ordering of all of your training data and then just take the end slice, for example. So for example, in this data set that we're looking at here, we wouldn't want all of our testing data to only be the highest dogs that we have. Um, we'd want it to be broadly representative throughout. So randomizing the data order is usually a good idea in order to be able to take a slice then and take say 20% for testing. Um, the other things you need to be wary about as well is things like time series data as well. You need to be cautious about how you deal with it in that case. But so hopefully that answers the question. Basically the answer is it's the same as the tra training data, um, but it's just a different part, part of that portion of that and say about 20% is usually about right. How does that how does that sound? And Lu, Lu, Luis as well, Luis and and Zat, Zatra, uh, Zatra, if you've got um, inputs on these questions as well, please <laughs> let me know what sure. your thoughts are there too. Oh, Zatra. And how are we going? Yeah. There's, there's lots of things going on in the chat here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, like, I think um, um, what I would like to add, I think, uh, uh, Mike, you covered everything, basically. So just uh, uh, we need to make sure that the testing data uh, should be, um, should have uh, basically, you know, um, uh, normally we do 70 to 30 percent or 80 to 20 percent, you know, uh, between testing and training. So this is how normally yep. we, we do that. And uh, yeah, that's that's the only thing I would like to add. And 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 also another key piece, Mike, and you you kind of hinted there, the the predictions and your models are going to act just as good as the quality of the data. If you have significant, um, there's a term in statistics. Um, it, if the data is significant enough, and your your sampling and your training is going to go well, if you don't have enough data points, no good of a model, no good of a strategy, no good of training, or no, doesn't matter how you break it, you know, reality is that the model is not going to, you know, you're going to do an overfit or underfit. Um, so having, you know, a lot of data points, and we're talking millions of data points, is what be, makes a, a, a robust machine learning algorithm, because then you have a really a, a big universe where the model can react to different you know, uh, extra pointers and other other conditions that otherwise, you know, you will you will miss. That's absolutely right. Absolutely. And, and I suppose and just probably one other thing is probably worth mentioning is that this is an example. This example that I've shown in this demonstration is uh, one type of algorithm. There are other types of algorithms um, and a lot of the terminology and a lot of the concepts that we're talking about will apply to those as well. So if it doesn't sort of fit with your particular use case of what you're thinking about right now, say this is dealing a lot with um, numeric data. 
if you're dealing with categorical data, so in other words, you know, um, you know, yes, no's, and uh, red, greens, and blues for different product items and stuff like that, a lot of this stuff can still apply as well. And the overarching message there, and um, Louis, thank you as well for reiterating this, the more data you can get, the better. And so machine learning, I often say this, machine learning really isn't that hard anymore, um, and it's... Uh, that's a, that's a loaded thing, and I'm, I'm expecting some pushback on that. But that's basically because a lot of this, um, the, a lot of the hard work's done for us already. We can operationalize a lot of this stuff. The challenge is getting good quality data for our for our training. So, um, yes, I see one question in there from someone called Adrian asking if um, the height and the amount of food can tell us how often the tail is going to wag per minute in the dog, and. Um, who knows? Maybe it could. So that's a case of switching the dimensions of your data around and deciding I want to predict on something else. You'll have to train your model in a different way. But I suspect that Adrian didn't really care what the answer was. So um, thank you, Adrian, for your question. <laughs> I know Adrian, by the way. Um, so um, what else have we got going on in the uh, chat at the moment? Yeah, actually, well, there is one question, a question from Honorio Dino, I hope I am pronouncing uh, it right. So uh, the question is um, that, you know, about the AWS Machine Learning Foundation course. So the question is that, uh, you know, um, how we can accelerate our learning uh, with this course? For sure. So um, I don't have a lot of details about specific courses. And so if there are specific questions about actual lessons in courses and 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 the way that the courses are taught, then the best thing to do is go directly to the support for that course. I can talk kind of in general terms here because I think that's probably really quite useful. That how can you accelerate your learning in machine learning generally? That's that's super important. And my advice in this area has always been find something that you can work on find your own project now i mentioned it a couple of times during that um during that presentation before i i, I said about domain expertise so um i'm pretending that i'm running the um the 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 rescue center and that I know all about dogs. And I only know about one dog and that's my dog, Sparky. So um, I'm not really an expert in all dogs, but that's the thing. Find something that you're actually a domain expert in. So this is potentially a hobby that you have um, or something that you do at work, potentially. It's, it's good if it's a hobby, right? Because it's something that you can be passionate about. And then try and find a machine learning um, a question that you can ask around around that thing that you're already a domain expert in. And then, and then put together a machine learning project around that. So try and um, gather lots of data from your knowledge of that thing and work on it. Honestly, it's exactly the same as learning anything. It's about practice. Um, and I've been helping people learn about AWS and get certified in AWS and now about machine learning for many years now. And my advice to you is always, don't just study a course, don't just read stuff, actually go and do stuff. And if you're not fortunate enough to have a job in machine learning yet or in a, in a company that has a machine learning practice, for example, go and do your own project. Um, go and do something amazing with machine learning. So find something that you already know about the data and start to build models and projects around that. That's my that's my number one suggestion. My second suggestion is to turn up to all of these live streams every week and ask any question you've got. And I'm sure we'll be able to help you out and accelerate your journey into machine learning that way. How does that sound? How's that for an answer? And that's, that's perfect, Mike. And, and I think we also have a very similar question that, uh, that Kim asked. Do you have any samples that are very uh, simple or that are easy to follow in order to learn these techniques and these uh, uh, these tools. I pasted a link of uh, we use a tool called SageMaker on AWS and SageMaker think about it as a is a, a multi uh, a mul uh, it has many 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 purposes but one of them um, is to create infrastructure on the back end for for you to have it is based and it can run into several different ways but it, it is based on Juniper notebooks Jupyter notebooks that are extremely simple to follow so that if you follow that link you will find very, uh, you know, some samples that solve some very complex problems like uh, uh, how to predict uh, churn in a, in, a, in a factory or you, know, you name it. And the, the, the interesting part, like I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, if you 
they are written in such an easy way that if you have fundamentals of programming, you understand a little bit of Python, you will be able to follow those examples, you know, very, very, uh, you know, even if you're a novice. And the more that you actually experiment and read those, and you start asking yourself questions, oh, how about if I, if I want to change, I wonder if I can just change this little part. Again, that's another easy way to for you to learn and to and to gain knowledge. Uh, be curious. That's that's one thing that we are. Uh, yeah, that's our motto here in AWS and Amazon in general. So um, uh, again, we we will pass it a link for for you to follow. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, look, I I I'd just like to to talk about SageMaker just for a moment as well. Um, I think that, and, and this is from an outsider's point of view, I don't work for AWS, and so I get to talk freely about these things. I think AWS, I think SageMaker can come across as quite scary because it's not like other services that AWS have. It's not like, uh, you know, EC2, it's a virtual machine. Uh, there, there are complexities to it, but it's a virtual machine. At the end of the day, it is what it is. With SageMaker, it's not a service. It's an entire suite of tools and lots and lots and lots and lots of things. And so when you look at the documentation, you can go, like, whoa, what is all of this stuff? And so we'll absolutely be getting into SageMaker um, in the next few weeks of doing this live stream as well. And we'll look at some demonstrations and samples of stuff you can do in there. But it is all encompassing, right? You've got everything from really easy, just throw some data in, it'll try a model to I want to get really uh, uh, elbows deep in code and I want to be putting together my own stuff. You can do all of this in SageMaker. Um, and and yeah, what, what Luis was talking about there um, is another part of what, well, I, I, I see it as another part of SageMaker is the documentation itself. It's not like the documentation on the AWS website normally is. This is now actually code that can be run. So those examples in there are are awesome and are part of SageMaker as well. So it's huge, right? Don't get don't get dissuaded by that. We'll step through it in um, subsequent weeks in this live stream. So yeah, definitely SageMaker is a great place to start. So Mike, uh, there is one more question actually uh, about the um, bias variance and bias and variance trade-off. So just a small concept around these three terms. Yep. <clears throat> Absolutely. And you know what I should do is I should probably go back to one of the slides that I had up before. Um, and uh, let me just get that slide ready because for whatever reason, I minimized it. Um, so yes, buyance various trade-off. Um, look, and this is the thing, right? With, um, with machine learning, um, you get lots and lots of terminology um, and it, it gets confusing. And I mean, maybe this is part of just understanding technical topics in general, but you need to get across what the terminology is so that you can have conversations um, with other people about the same topic. And so there's probably multiple ways that you can talk about all of these kinds of uh, metrics and things like this and performance and the rest of it inside of machine learning as a whole. Um, I've got this slide up. This is probably a reasonably good slide. To, to represent what I wanted to show here. Um, actually, do you know what? Um, well, yeah, it's the it's the overfit underfit thing. So when you're talking about bias and variance, also think about the overfit, um, it's the overfit and the underfit models that we were talking about before. Um, so I've got a couple on here. Obviously, these are the two wiggly line or the wiggly line um, and the straight line. The wiggly line goes through every single one of the data points that we have, and so. We said that that's overfit because it doesn't generalize well for real world data. Um, we essentially say that this has low bias to that original data, but it has that large variance to the data that we'll see in the real world. Whereas the straight line, it actually has a large bias because it doesn't actually go through any of the data points, but it has a low variance because overall it does a better job of representing all data. So I haven't gone into low level detail about how these things are calculated and specifically defined, but that's probably the easiest way to look at it. It's the difference between being overfit and underfit. If you have a large bias, then you're generalizing well. If you have a low bias, then you're actually going to end up being overfit. I guess in, in the amount of time we've got available here and the, sort of the depth that we want to get into here, that would be the way I describe the difference between um, bias and variance. And, and it's really, people talk about the bias variance trade-off and we can see what that is here. So, so you want to get a balance between the two, usually. You don't want to have something which exactly fits all of your 
training data, you don't want to have something that only fits your testing data. You want to be somewhere in between the two. H how'd that sound? Luis, have you got any sort of further insights on that? I'm just going to throw you in there. Mm -hmm. No, that, that, that's, that's, that's a you know, very good rule of thumb that, that uh, 730, you know, is, is a good, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good rule of thumb. Um, one thing that you want to do after you run your first you know, test, um, there are some things called, and I don't want to kind of co overcomplicate this, but there are some things called hyperparameters, you know, and that think about it as uh, other things that you can tweak on the data. So it's always useful to vary one of those little levers that you have uh, kind of to see how prevalent that is. Um, that is a better thing to do rather than changing, you know, how many, data points are going to be sample uh, testing and how much is going to be actual uh, uh, training. So normally it's sure. good if you leave, you know, the marks and then you play with the other levels for for uh, for uh, model uh, uh, accuracy. Yeah, yeah, sure. So so talking specifically, I guess, um, by, by, bias I, and variance. Oh, go ahead, Safda. Sorry, sorry uh, Mike. Uh, so just I would like to add uh, uh, one thing that, you know, we can always look at variance, high variance as uh, that if the model is high, if the variance is high, it means our model has learned the, has memorized the training data. It has not generalized and that results in overfitting. So please remember high variance means that model has memorized the pattern rather than generalizing, right? So this is, uh, and this is not good for us it means that our model cannot, uh, uh, you know, address the real world unknown data types. So this is, this is, you know, just memorization, high variance, mo model memorized, no generalization. Love it. Absolutely. I'm just seeing if I can get back to my, um, yeah. So my, my model that generalizes well. So the model that generalizes well, it hasn't been overly influenced by the training data to the detriment of that testing data. And so we're saying it has low variance. Um, so I've just put, put that slide up there, Safdar, just to illustrate what you're talking about there. Sure, sure. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. Uh, we awesome. have one more question, awesome question. actually. We have one yeah, yeah. more question. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, this is about online gaming development. So um, the ask is that what are the other domain areas uh, where the reinforcement learning can be used? What, are the, what areas can reinforcement learning be yeah. used? Yes, sure, 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 sure. So, um, well, it's so, okay. So we didn't talk about reinforcement learning. We didn't talk about different types of machine learning, but as a rule, just so that we're all on the same page, um, we, we often talk about three different types of machine learning. There are, there are more than three, but three big, big ticket items, if you like. We've got um, supervised learning, which is a lot about what we've just been talking about today. Um, we have unsupervised learning, which is about pattern finding and data pre-processing quite often. We can talk more in depth about this in this session or other sessions. And then we have reinforcement learning. And so, so everybody is aware reinforcement learning is essentially like training a dog. I'm going to go back to the dogs again with the dog. With the dog, like if you want it to do something, you give it a treat when it does the right thing. You don't give it a treat when it doesn't do the right thing. Let's say that. Um, so if it, uh, you know, it, it walks next to you as you're walking to the park and it doesn't bark at any of the dogs, it gets a treat. If it starts barking and running off, then it doesn't get a treat. And so it's about um, reward and a reward training method. And that's exactly what, um, what uh, reinforcement learning does. Now um, in AWS, and most of you probably know this already, um, the poster child for that essentially is, um, is this fella here, which is the, uh, the deep racer car. Um, this deep racer car, this is the, obviously the physical version of the deep racer car. And you're able to train a model in a virtual environment um, to be able to race one of these cars around a track. Okay, so we're sort of quick primer there on reinforcement learning, um, very quick. And if you wanna go more in depth than anybody, please ask questions. Um, I suppose that now, I'm, now I'm like, what's the specific question this after, sorry? Yeah, so, so the, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, please. And the, the question is what other, you know, 
what are the things can besides gaming can these type of right. algorithms be used? And just like you said, Max, uh, yeah. you know, self-driving cars is one prime. Self-driving drones uh, or self-flying drones, I would say. You know, the ones yeah. that you see on the Olympics and all that. All that, you know, is you know, they have a you know, a reinforced model yeah. as well. Yes, absolutely. So actually, and I find this is a really interesting question, actually, because, um, you know, would you actually teach a car how to drive itself with reinforcement learning? Um, maybe, maybe not. Like, is a Tesla actually teaching itself how to drive with reinforcement learning? Um, and kind of not, right? So it's not going to just, they're not going to send a whole bunch of Teslas down a track and smash them all into walls. And it's like, well, none of these worked and we told it it didn't work and we'll figure out when it gets it right obviously a lot of this stuff's done in virtual uh, virtual space um so yeah as louis said um robotics is an area where it is used and it's used for solving complicated problems the little caveat i'm going to say here though is it's maybe sometimes overused like if you've got a robot and it needs to pick up an object from one location and put it down in another location then just program it to do that. It's not it's not that hard. Um, doing something with reinforcement learning is about trying to optimize that, trying to optimize very complex things. So manufacturing workflows, things like that, you can use reinforcement learning for it. Um, but make sure that your problem is sufficiently complicated enough that you're not just trying to, um, you know, crack an egg with a hammer here and it is actually appropriate. I, I heard Elon Musk talking about this the other day because he does obviously a lot of if you hear him talk about the manufacturing process of Tesla's. Um, he talks a lot about that because um, his prime job, as I understand it, has been to optimize the manufacturing process of the cars. Like the, the actual car itself and all the tech inside the car is pretty cool, but in order to actually be able to make a sustainable and scalable business, the optimization has had to be in the manufacturing process. And he's found that part of it way harder. And he was asked about whether he used machine learning to optimize some of the robotics in the factory. And he just said no, because it's like it's not suitably complicated enough. So I know I've answered the question with what you shouldn't use it for, but it's it's complex scenarios where it would otherwise take someone a long time to be able to optimize or a long time in order to be able to um, to program. Um, other than that, a lot of the time you see it used in research and people having a lot of fun with it, as we do with with Deep Racer and playing games and stuff like that. So it, it, it's, it's a challenge here because um, Deep learning is exciting to look at, but the vast majority of your time as a machine learning engineer, you're going to be spent with um, with um, the the other type. What is it? The um, supervised learning. Thank you. It's going to be spent with supervised learning, making supervised learning models, which is super exciting as well, right? Um, that they just don't smash into the walls quite so often. How's that go? Um, um, yeah, and I think uh, one thing also which I think like, you know, the Mars rover, uh, I was reading a very interesting article that, you know, the signal from the Earth reaches with the, with the, with the, with the delay actually. And, and, and somehow the Mars rover has to make his own decision, right? During that mm -hmm. time. So this is, this is another example where, you know, the reinforcement learning, it, it can understand and it can take decisions on its own and enhance its processing with every learning. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, so ex exactly that. Complex robotic problems. And obviously, in that case, they've got the complexities of that that immense distance as well. Um, but they've also had the ability to be able to simulate that um, on Earth in simulations and start to build the models there. So that's the other thing to sort of point out is that reinforcement learning builds a model that you can then use to control um, at a later point. And retraining aside, you're essentially using that model. So this this deep racer car here that I'm talking about, it doesn't actually do any machine learning itself. It makes inference. It uses the model to drive itself um, from a model which has been trained in a virtual environment. So yeah, super, super interesting topic there. Uh, there is one more question, Mike, about uh, virtual race competition, actually, specifically. So uh, the question is that um, if uh, we need to improve my uh, the model and set some custom action space to perform better. So the, the question is how to perform better. Um, um, basically, there was a virtual race competition uh, from AWS. 
So the, uh, the user, um, I think Osni is asking for some advice on that. <clears throat> Sure. Look, so I've, I've I've got the car. I've entered a race. I did quite well. I beat the people I wanted to beat. And so I'm happy about that. I actually know uh, very well the person who won as well. So um, let me just preface it with that. I have done a little bit of deep racer racing, but not a lot recently. It has in the last few months sort of kicked off in a huge way, I think, since um, since lockdown occurred. Lots of people just spending lots of time trying to optimize those models. Um, there are lots of ways that you can improve your performance. And um, there's everything from the sort of uh, tweaking around with the code, which is sort of made available in the console, to completely ripping the whole thing apart and just doing it yourself and having your own virtualized environments and uh, tweaking the performance to a point where, honestly, it's almost kind of a little bit over the top, I'd suggest. I don't think that necessarily this live stream is the best place to be able to go through everything. Um, there is a, an awesome Slack channel, and we'll find that. Um, uh, actually, Zafdar, um, uh, you're, you're in this Slack channel with me. Maybe if there's a way to post a link to this, um, maybe we sure. can get some help and post a link to that to make sure that you're in that Slack channel. There's a lot of conversation sure. about optimization for races in there. It's specifically about um, running deep racer races and deep racer optimization, things like that. They also have races as well, and they have live streams about how to tweak the performance of your car. So it is it is super exciting. Um, and yeah, I think this live stream is probably going to sort of be almost like a companion to that one. That one's going to be all about deep racer and how you can make your deep racer models race really well. This one's going to be more about the actual nuts and bolts of machine learning, um, learning machine learning, and sort of getting towards the point where you can actually start to work in machine learning as well in the real world. How's that? Great. What time is it for you, Safta? You're, you're turning on your light. Is th things are getting <laughs> yeah, dark in Chicago. Yeah, 7.27 p.m. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, no, it's getting late. It's getting late. So it's, um, it's just coming up to half past 10 in the morning here, uh, Saturday morning in, um, in Brisbane. Luis, what time is it for you? It is uh, uh, 7.30, so still lovely. 7.30, okay, yeah. So, yes. And but but the the steam whistles seem to have stopped. There's not much so much going on there. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, they, they they you know they sold out product, so they they can go home now. They can go <laughs> and watch po soap poppers. Yes. I'm fa <laughs> I'm fascinated by this. I, I need to come and have a look at it one day. Okay. <laughs> How are we doing? We're just we're just kind of getting to the point now where we're probably going to start to to wrap things up because we're just coming up to the. Um, more or less one hour. We were slightly late to start because of some slight technical issues I had where my computer completely decided to crash just before go live. I've been planning for this for such a long time. I was like, right, we're about to go live and bang, the computer just went. So that was that was exciting. So um, we'll go for a few more minutes if we've got a couple more questions. Um, there's also a question or two from that we had prior to go live as well. So and any any other key questions you've got coming up here? Yes, uh, one question um, is there, uh, I think it's specifically for you, Mike. So um, the question is, what are your favorite machine learning use cases? Oh, okay. That puts me on the spot. Um, yeah, okay. So um, I actually, uh, w when I do experimentation, when I put together like just my own projects, I was talking before about working on things that you're particularly interested in yourself. Um, I like working in the computer vision space. So I like using uh, neural networks, convolutional neural networks, doing things like object detection and image classification and things like that. So I find that really interesting. And there's a couple of reasons why. One is because it's really, um, you know, we talked before about getting data sets, getting large data sets. Um, and I've got numerous ways that I can collect large imagery data sets. That's probably a topic for another stream. Actually, I'd love to show you about that and um, because I've got some pretty awesome stuff happening in that space um, where I can actually get uh, vast quantities of image data in order to be able to do object detection. Um, the other reason, and, and, and the projects that I'm specifically doing, um, some of you probably already know this, uh, but I am interested in a few things. One of them is Lego, um, and we have lots of Le I've had lots of Lego in my life for a very long time. I'm never too far away from Lego. Um, there's some just around the other side of that monitor. I can't reach it. Um, 
we have lots of Lego in this house and I'm very keen on building the ultimate Lego brick sorting machine. Um, this is something that other people have had a go at and I just want to have a go at doing it myself as well. So I, I am doing that. I'm in the process of sort of getting the tech sorted out and the machine learning sorted out so that I can actually have a camera on a, um, on a Lego brick and have it classified so I can sort it mechanically, robotically. Um, uh, and that's ultimately my, my goal there. So that's the thing that I'm kind of super interested in, machine learning uh, for computer vision and my, my Lego brick sorting machine. So um, what algorithms, if you want to get more technical, what algorithms under the hood are making that happen? Um, most of the case, that's going to be things like convolutional neural networks. I use SageMaker quite a lot as well. So SageMaker's actually got built-in uh, object detection model, built-in image classification model. So using those, um, also using things you may have seen, I've got videos up of me using um, recognition custom labels. Recognition is a out of the box kind of a uh, pre-built machine learning solution that AWS have. You just get to throw data at it and it produces the model. It is kind of expensive, so um, it's interesting to do a demo on. And look, let's say that we'll have some demonstrations on this stream. I'm making a commitment now um, of doing some image classification object detection with SageMaker. How about that? Um, and of course, it's going to be, well, maybe it's going to be Lego brick centric. I don't know. We'll see about that. But uh, yeah, that's 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 what gets me going. That's that's what I'm interested and excited about. It actually, actually, that is the very very first project that I ever worked on in machine learning um, was exactly that was that that, um, that problem space. And I'm still going. I know the machine learning bit is kind of sorted. I just need to get the robotics side of things, and that's way harder for me than um, than the machine learning part. Um, but I'm making a start, and I'll have more to talk about that in, in the coming weeks. Awesome. That's so fantastic. Cool. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. You you make, right. you make us feel all, so lame, Mike. You know, it's like, oh, man. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, you haven't seen it yet, so we'll see, we'll see it working. But uh, yeah, no, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I'm pretty excited. I've got plenty of videos about that, actually, um, up online. So it's probably worth mentioning as well. And this is kind of like the the bit, the thing that you need to do with these YouTube-y types of things. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel. Um, it's probably a good idea as well to do that notification bell thing as well, um, so that you can make sure you're up to date with all the content that I'm putting out. Because I do produce videos about this stuff. And we'll also be having this live streams about this stuff. Um, as well. So do that. Um, I also have um, a place on LinkedIn as well. So it'd be really cool for people to, um, to join me there. And I think I've got a way that I can help you find me on LinkedIn. Um, with, uh, with this, I just click that button and that button. There's a lot of buttons here to click when you're doing this kind of stuff. Um, let's uh, put that up there. And so, yeah, I know cameras at the ready, I guess. Whoa, there we go. Um, there's a QR code. You can find me on LinkedIn just by searching for me. Um, if you're not currently with me on LinkedIn, then I appreciate you connecting with me on there because um, we get to have further conversations. And look, I'll, I'll be hanging around on LinkedIn after this stream as well. That's going to essentially be the, um, the after party for this stream. We'll go over to LinkedIn. I'll put a post up. And um, actually, there's a post already up saying I'm live in 30 or 20 minutes. So let's just put comments below that. And um, we can keep the conversation going on in there as well. How about we do that? How about we do that? I'll put that code up again in just a moment, or just search for me on LinkedIn. So, um, Luis Safda, thank you so much for helping me out do this Ask Me Anything. Um, we mentioned right back at the beginning that there were a couple of prize giveaways. Um, and I maybe rather unfairly just completely expected you to help me to figure out where those were going to go. Um, so, um, $100 AWS credits. Um, for the best newbie question. That's what I promised. Have you got any thoughts in that space? Did you remember to look for one? <laughs> I can have a look too. I don't know, Safar. I personally like the question about, you know, what other uh, use cases uh, you can have, uh, you know, on, on uh, beyond, beyond just video games. I think that was a very thoughtful question. That, yeah, I, I, yeah. I like that. You know, I don't know. I like that was okay. Yeah, yep. So the re the reinforcement learning question. I'm hoping that's the one because I've said it now. That's mm -hmm. yeah, yep, yep. Cool. All right. 
maybe I could ask you just to sort of make a note of who that was, um, copy and paste it down somewhere. We'll find a way of um, of getting that to you. Have we had any helpers in the in the chat today? Have we had any helpers that we need to shout out and thank to them for helping us in chat? Or has everyone been captivated by what we've been presenting? <laughs> Dead, de deathly silence. <laughs> I think somebody, some, well, no, somebody uh, provided a very good um, uh, uh, a comment to, uh, to give a sense of, you know, what's the best way to get introduced to machine learning, which was to do, you know, the events of DeepRacer. You know, if you if you have absolutely no expertise and want to get your hands on, I think that's a very great suggestion. I mean, you can have these other things that we were suggesting, but what a better way to yeah. introduce yourself to, you know, machine learning that to by playing with it. Hmm. Sounds awesome. All right, let's say that you also get $100 of AWS credits um, for you to be able to spend in your account and hopefully do lots of fun things with uh, machine learning. Don't spend it all on DeepRacer. I mean, some of it maybe, but you can do some other things as well. Um, and I think the secondary answer, of course, to that is to make sure that you um, come and join us on all the live streams that we're doing in this space, um, because I think that'll help out as well. But yeah, DeepRacer is good as well. It's just a different channel, essentially. We'll make sure that we um, we collaborate with them over there. Um, so Thomas will be uh, will be grateful that we uh, we work together. All right. So I, I, if you've got the names, you can shout them out. Otherwise, we can um, also um, get in touch with them um, and uh, make sure that we get those credits to them. So uh, look, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for taking part in this first stream. Um, it's been a journey to get here, and it'll all be smoother from here on in. Um, thank you to Safdar. Thank you to Luis as well um, for helping me answer a lot of the questions and uh, keep tabs on everything that's going on. Um, thanks also to Paxton, who's in the background of all of this, helping sort of organize everybody and keep everybody together as well. Um, please do connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd very much appreciate that. And make sure that you subscribe to this channel as well. Um, if you can as well, like this um, stream. I think you can like streams, right? It helps uh, YouTube understand that this was worthwhile content and helps other people find this stuff as well. Um, so one last time to say thanks so much to uh, Luis all the way from Mexico with your steam in the background. Thank you very much. And thank you to Safdar there in Chicago. Thank you so much to everybody for watching. And we shall see you next time. Goodbye.